This presentation is time series analysis of real world data using ARIMA and the Box Jenkins methodology. The objective of this analysis is to provide timely and accurate forecasts of student enrollments based on time series trends in both marketing leads data and student enrollments using the Box Jenkins method and tools related to seasonal ARIMA forecasting. The result of this analysis will take the form of a seasonal mixed model, ARIMA, lowercase pdq, uppercase pdq, with a defined period. The data that we have consists of marketing leads and enrollment data from a variety of different schools and different programs in different locations. The data is originally at the daily level and we have leads and enrollment information for that data. Based on the date stamp, we can also derive the weekday, whether it's a holiday, a weekend, and the day of the week. And this supplemental data can be useful in regression analysis to accompany the REMA analysis. The characteristics of the data are complex where we have data not from a single product or a single location, but we have data from a variety of different programs in different locations that don't necessarily match up other than an overall academic calendar. So the trends are complex and definitely not clear. They're highly variable based on the month, based on the day, based on the week. Oftentimes, especially with the daily data, there's very low volume. Uh, weekdays in particular tend to be zero. Mondays and Fridays tend to be very low. And as mentioned, there's great seasonal com uh, complexity with an atypical academic year and program lengths that vary from eight, nine, 10, 12, 15, to 24 different or 24 months. Since this is real world data, the level of complexity is quite a bit higher than the textbook examples that we are typically given for ARIMA problem solving. So if we look at the graph to the upper right, we see air passenger data by month. We see a trend, but we see clear regular seasonality. If we look at the chart at the bottom right, we see the real world data then enrollment data by week, where what we see is a wide degree of variability, heteroscedasticity, a trend, but not necessarily a clear trend. So the application of ARIMA technology, of the ARIMA process is going to be a bit messier than the textbook situation. The structure of this presentation will be to walk through the Box Jenkins process to arrive at the REMA model for our data. So we'll start with exploratory analysis and the topic of white noise, model identification, parameter estimation, and model checking. Visualization is a key part of the REMA process, both in the exploratory portion and in the rest of the process. ARIMA modeling and the Box Jenkins process, unfortunately, is a bit as much art as it is science. But let's start here with time series plots of the raw data and see what we can find. What we see in our two different data sets, leads and enrollments at three different time periods or roll-ups, daily, weekly, and monthly, is that there's a definite trend, downward trend, in the data over time, but a high degree of variability. We can see just by looking at these graphs that this is not white noise. There is informational content within this information. We also see that the data is not stationary. There is a definite trend, and it does not revolve around a, a, a a stable mean. So we need to deal with that in our treatments. We also see 
and we'll see a little bit better in future graphs, the issue of heteroscedasticity, where the variances change over time and that we'll have to deal with that in our data in order to maximize the quality of our REMA forecasting. After the exploratory analysis and the determination that our data sets are not white noise and that our REMA forecasting is likely to provide some value, we can proceed to model identification, where we're going to look more in depth at the issue of stationarity and the differencing that we need to apply in case there is state, um, a lack of stationarity. We'll also look at heteroscedasticity and we'll apply the Box-Cox transformation in order to treat our data. As mentioned, ARIMA analysis is as much art as science. We've already looked at the data and we've seen that there's a clear trend in the data, which means that it is not stationary. However, we could apply the augmented Dickey-Fuller unit root test in order to determine statistically whether the data is stationary. With this test, the ADF test, the alternative hypothesis is that the data is stationary. So the null hypothesis is that um, it is not stationary. Running the augmented Dickey-Fuller unit root test tells us that our data is non-stationary, but we already saw that from the plot of the raw data. What we really need is the differencing that we need to treat the data both on the seasonal differences and on the regular differences. To do this, we make use of the NSDIFFs function and the INDIFF function in R. The NSDIFFs function is for the number of seasonal differences that are required to treat the data, and the INDIFF function gives us the number of regular differences required. Both of these functions are leveraged internally within the auto REMA function that will be mentioned later. Combining the results of the augmented Dickey-Fuller test and the NSDIFF function and the INDIFF function, what we see is that the statistical output suggests that we need zero seasonal differencing and one level of regular differencing. Now, we will see later that this doesn't necessarily coincide with, a, with our visual interpretation of the data, but uh, this gives us a good starting point for understanding our data and to begin our analysis. So for our first treatment of the data, we can difference the data. Again, we're not going to apply any seasonal differencing because that doesn't appear to be indicated by our previous statistical output. So if we apply the regular differencing one lag to um, each of our data sets for each of our periods, daily, weekly, and monthly, we see that in each case, the data visually appears to be stationary. As I mentioned earlier, the data is heteroscedastic, which means there's a greater degree of variance at some locations within the data than others. This, it is possible to execute the REMA calculations or the REMA modeling on heteroscedastic data. However, it will degrade the quality of the forecast. So in order to improve our results, we should transform the data. Often what is mentioned is log treatment of the data or squaring the data. However, there's another easier process, which is to leverage the Box-Cox transformation. The Box-Cox transformations vary between uh, a third root or third cube of the data or the inverse uh, third cube of the data and include all the transformations in between, including the log transformation. So at the Box-Cox formula 
will calculate lambda as the attribute or as the measure of the transformation, where zero is logged information and one indicates no change or really a, um, a uh, the data raised to the power of one. So in R, the to calculate lambda, we would use boxcox dot lambda, and to transform the data, we would then use boxcox and include the lambda metric as part of the function. In this chart, we see the boxcox transform data. So because there was a high degree of variability in the data, a one size fits all tra transformation is not going to perfectly smooth the data, but it does look to be more evenly distributed after the Boxcox transformation than before. And that's in all three cases, the daily data, the weekly data, and the monthly data. Now that we have identified the transformations required for the data and we have made the required transformations, we can move on to parameter estimation. In particular, I'm going to focus on the use of ACF and PACF and the resulting AR and MA orders that we're looking for, both seasonal and non-seasonal. The rules to interpret the ACF or autocorrelation function plot and the partial autocorrelation function plot become very complex with real data. The basic rules are difficult enough. The basic rules to interpret non-seasonal ACF and PACF plots are well known for the, the calculation of the AR parameters, we expect to see the ACF autocorrelations tail off, and then we look for our parameter to the PACF, and we see that the number of significant spikes should give us an indication of our AR order. The opposite is true for our MA order, where we see the PACF tail off and we look instead to the number of significant spikes in the ACF plot. When we have both AR and MA relationships, both tail off and the situation becomes murky even before we arrive at seasonality. When we arrive at seasonality, the same basic rules are true. However, the interrelationships are much more complex and the graphs uh, provided in the ACF plot and the PACF plot are much more complex and much more difficult to interpret. Looking at the ACF and PACF plots for the enrollment, we see daily, weekly, and monthly uh, ACF and PCF plots. For the daily information, what we see is a very slow decay, which suggests possibly that we might try uh, models with seasonal differencing in addition to the models without seasonal differencing. When we look at the weekly enrollment information, we see a better decay, um, still long, but we see that drop off, which indicates that perhaps we don't need any more differencing in this data. When we look at the monthly information, we do not see this decline over time. We just see spikes at one lag and potentially at lag 12. And so we are pretty comfortable with our treatments of our data um, at this point. So for estimating the AR and MA orders, we've gone over the rules for the visual inspection of the ACF and PACF plots, 
And one of the models that I evaluated were based on this visual inspection methodology. But there's also two other basic approaches that can be used. Another, another is the usage of the autoarema process, which calculates iteratively through in-sample testing and tries to evaluate uh, the best model given a basic set of assumptions. And we, what we also have are default seasonal orders. These are seasonal arema models that tend to be useful in many different circumstances. They're very simple models, so they're very parsimonious, um, but uh, experts have found that they tend to be useful in many cases. So now that we've looked at parameter estimation with the ACF and PACF plots and the rules for evaluating MA and AR orders, we can move to model checking. With model checking, what we do is we make use of the auto REMA function and the REMA function to generate models that we can evaluate with in sample testing, in particular with the residuals analysis. We can also use a form of cross validation called back testing to evaluate the data and come up with a better, more authoritative evaluation of model accuracy. It is this back testing that will allow us to choose our final model. When we look at the residuals that result from our models, one of the key components of our process will be to leverage box testing, in particular, the Iljung uh, box test. What we're using with what we're doing with this is we're looking at the resulting residuals to see whether all of the information has been successfully captured or transformed by the REMA process. If there's still information left in the residuals, then we've probably not arrived at our final model. With the Eljung test, Eljung box test, the null hypothesis is that the data is white noise. So very small p-values, which allow us to accept the null or the alternative hypothesis, or at least not reject it, indicate remaining significant autocorrelation. Using box Iljung tests is as much art as science to, to the degree that we are trying to look at the results of the tests at different lag periods. Here I've calculated the test at uh, lag 7, 14, 21, and 28. But the test could potentially have a null result um, at one lag and a, an alternative result at another lag. So this is there's definitely a, an, an element of judgment involved. What we hope to see is that at all the lags that we test, we will only see an indications of white noise. In this slide, we see three different visual presentations that are useful in residuals analysis. We see the plot of the residuals. We see the ACF of the residuals. And we see a visual representation of the Iljung box test. In this case, we look at the raw data and, or the, rather the residuals data, and we see that there might perhaps still be some information in this data. It doesn't look like pure white noise. However, 
when we look at the ACF, we don't see any statistically significant spikes. So that gives us a degree of confidence. Again, when we look at the Iljung box test, we don't see any points that are within the threshold that would allow us to accept the or fail to reject the alternative hypothesis. So we can therefore accept the null hypothesis that the resulting residuals are white noise and that the, this is a valid and useful model. Although the forecast plot is not residuals analysis, it's often done at the same time as residuals analysis. So when we take a model, in this case, we're looking at the uh, seasonal catch-all model number one, the, the simple uh, 011011 uh, plus seasonality model. We, we can use this and look at the model and see whether the, the fitted information seems to uh, match the real information and also whether the forecast seems to be visually in line with our historic information. And in this case, what we see is not a great match, but um, it doesn't look too far out of line uh, to be of potential use in forecasting the data. So as was mentioned prior, uh, the best evaluation of multiple different ARIMA models is backtesting. With backtesting, what we have is an equivalent to cross-validation, where what we're doing is we're looking at the accuracy as calculated over a large number of different windows with the data. The advantage here is that we don't see just one snapshot of accuracy, but we have an average of as many windows as possible. Now, this is not true in sample and out of sample testing, but it is the best equivalent that we might have with simple time series analysis. With this project, we evaluated seven different models and with our back testing we ranked them from best to worst based on their, their RMSE scores. So interestingly the best model was one of the generic catch-all models the very parsimonious 011 011 uh, model and it performed better than far better than uh, it, than uh, the ARIMA based models that were that came out automatically from auto ARIMA. The second model in terms of performance was the second uh, seasonal catch all ARIMA model. Again, a very parsimonious approach, uh, 101, 011, um, that I guess the two catch-all models avoid problems uh, rather than trying to achieve uh, perfection, but um, they deliver, in this case, reasonable performance. The third model was a model where we forced Auto Arima to accept that uh, there should be seasonal differencing in the data and that there was a drift. In this particular case, we have a 102 and a 011 model, and this performed pretty close to our catch all models, but not quite as good. Our third model, our fourth model rather, was actually a model where we combined regression analysis with the REMA, where we were looking at whether the days were um, uh, holidays or weekend days, 
and then what day of the week they were. And um, we thought that this would provide substantial value with our daily information. Uh, surprisingly, it the combination of the regression information and the regular reamer process did not lead to the superior model. Instead, it, the results uh, put it in the middle of the pack. Our manual model, where I evaluated probable um, uh, MA and P, uh, or AR and MA um, orders based on the ACF and PACF plots, um, luckily wasn't last. So that hopefully says something about my um, evaluation, um, but it did come um, in at the fifth level. Then, at the near the end of the pack, what we have is a auto REMA model that was generated when looking at AIC and when looking at a AICC and BIC. That so in each case, um, the output of the auto REMA function was a non parsimonious uh, five one zero two zero zero. Um, unfortunately, it just, the auto REMA did not perform particularly well with this data. The last model in, um, in terms of performance was basically a white noise model, a seasonal naive model where it was the extremely parsimonious 000010. And uh, luckily, our other all of our other, other models perform better than the seasonal naive model. My basic learnings from this process is that ARIMA was probably the wrong approach for this task. ARIMA focuses on modeling the behavior of the next H data points. It doesn't focus on the trend. For the business problem at hand, trying to uh, predict the trend, um, perhaps a smoothing-based approach would have been better than the REMA, particularly with data that is this complex and messy.